So we're moving right along and moving on to thinking and problem solving. So remember that unit seven is on cognition, which is all about thinking, right? And we've talked now about memory and forgetting. Let's move forward to cognition itself, and that is thinking, which then leads to problem solving. And there's lots of different things to think about here. So thinking or cognition, it refers to a process that involves knowing, understanding, remembering, and communicating. All of these things being kind of buzzwords for cognition and the cognitive perspective. I should note that we're not really talking about the cognitive perspective here though, we're just talking about cognition in general and the process of thinking. So concepts is the big overarching concept or term that I, we have to start with. Concepts are mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, or people. They are a variety, well, let me give you this as an example. There are a variety of chairs, but their common features define the concept of chair. So the concept is chair. It's like a category that you have in your brain that organizes things. So what are some of these common features? It has a seat, it has a back, it has some kind of legs or base. Some can be on wheels, some aren't, some rock, some are stable, some recline, some don't, right? But you know a chair when you see it, even though that um, maybe you see a different kind of chair for the first time, you can kind of think, well, that's just a different kind of chair, but it's a chair. You get it because it's a concept. So the development of concepts, we form some concepts by definition. So an example would be a triangle has three sides. Bam, you get it. But mostly we form concepts by a mental image or a best example, which is our prototype. For instance, um, a robin is a prototype of a bird, but penguin or ostrich is not. Okay, a prototype, once again, is your mental image or a best example that you have for a concept. Concepts tend to be mentally represented as schemas, and I don't want you to confuse prototype and schema. Your prototype is your mental image in your brain best example. Your schema and you should write this down, is the list of characteristics of the concept. So let me review a little bit more, and you should probably have some kind of three-tier graphic organizer on your notes right now. Concepts is the big overarching, it's simply the category of the idea, right? So bird, let's say. Your schema is underneath concept. It is the list of characteristics of that concept. So a bird has a beak, it has feet, it has feathers, sometimes they can fly, okay? And then under that is your prototype. And your prototype is your mental image or your best example you have in your brain. So schemas help us understand what the concept is and often cause us to generate expectations about what that concept does. So let's look at the concept of a police officer. What is your prototype or mental image of an officer. Maybe you have a family member who's a cop, or maybe you watch the show Cops on Saturday night, you think of one of those people, or maybe from a movie you think of someone. What are some of the common features all of them have? This would be the schema, right? This is, they wear a uniform, they have a badge, they carry a gun. Most of the time they are male, at least that's what you think of, right? As we develop a schema or characteristics of police officers, we would expect them to wear uniforms and help people in need and drive the car, okay? So as we kind of create that schema, the schema of the concept, we start to make have expectations about what all cops do. So we're gonna get back to this whole concept schema thing, but we're gonna kind of segue here to problem solving. There are three ways to solve problems. One is an algorithm. And lots of you are like, oh no, math. Or some of you are like, oh, math, okay, I get this. But we're not talking with math, although it could apply. It's the methodical logical rule or procedure that guarantees solving a particular problem. So algorithms will exhaust all possibilities before arriving at a solution. They take a long time. Computers use algorithms. Okay? You exhaust all possibilities before arriving to the solution. Let's say you wanted to find oatmeal at the grocery store, and here's our example. Using an algorithm, you would search every single aisle until you found the oatmeal. That would be an algorithm in real life. A heuristic, however, this is more simple thinking strategies um, that often 
allow us to make judgments and solve problems efficiently. Okay, so they don't take as long. They enhance the likelihood of success, but they cannot assure it. So that's a difference from an algorithm. With an algorithm, you are guaranteed to solve the problem. With a heuristic, they are more error prone than algorithms. So an example being um, with finding the oatmeal, you use a heuristic. Um, you would read the signs at the end of the aisle and look for cereal and look in that aisle first for oatmeal. You're probably going to find it there, but you're not as guaranteed as an algorithm. Uh, however, it's not going to take you as long. So heuristics are error prone, but they take a shorter time. Algorithms take forever, but you're, it's a surefire way to get the answer. Insight, which we've kind of talked before, it involves sudden novel realization of a solution to a problem. It's your aha experience. You'll often need some prior experience and initial trial and error to gain insight though. And insight is in humans and animals as we saw with insight learning back in unit six. Brain imaging and EEG studies suggest that when an insight strikes, this is your light bulb turning on, right? Or your aha moment. It activates the right temporal cortex. So the time between not knowing the solution to knowing it is like a split second. Now we're going to talk about obstacles in solving problems um, and that we kind of talked about thinking. Now let's talk about where our thinking can go wrong and really our thinking can be the obstacles in solving problems. Fixation is kind of a broad term for for a couple of things we're going to talk about. It's the inability to see a problem from a fresh perspective. The impediment, it is an impediment to solving problems, right? And two examples are one being mental set. Your mental set, and we've kind of talked about perceptual set before, so think about that. Um, but your mental set is the tendency for old patterns of problem solving to persist and then make it impossible for you to see new ways to solve the problem. Um, let me give you an example, and it's kind of a silly example, but so you know how when you walk up to Target, okay, and there's two like sets of double doors. One set is automatic and the other set is not, okay? Which I guess we don't have to use Target in the two sets, but have you ever seen or have you ever been someone who walks up to a double set of doors and you're thinking it's automatic, right? They should open. Well, your mental set is probably going to have you like maybe stomp on the floor to make the doors open or walk back out a little bit and then walk back in trying to make the doors open or like waving your hands because you think the camera or monitor up there will open the door for you. Your mental set um, prevents you from just pushing the door and opening it, right? This is kind of a silly example of a mental set. The other one is functional fixedness. This is a tendency to think of the only familiar functions for objects. Okay, so um, for instance, can you name the ways you could use a fork? So Ariel in The Little Mermaid who uses a fork to brush her hair, she does not suffer from functional fixedness. You've got to get that clear in your brain. Someone who does suffer from functional fixedness, let's say they're looking for their keys and all they bring out of their pocket is like some change in a paper clip that they had left over from school or something. If they succumb to functional fixedness, they will not see that they can pick the lock with the paper clip because paper clip is only for paper clipping, right? Um, so they can't then solve their problem of unlocking the door without a key. Confirmation bias is a tendency to search for information that confirms or proves a personal bias. So we seek evidence to support ideas, but we also tend to dismiss evidence that is contrary to our way of thinking. So for instance, you believe your boyfriend is faithful. So rather than notice he is often receiving text messages from other girls and isn't as available for dates as he once was, you pay attention to the fact that the call he calls you once a day, even if it's only for a few moments, and always brings you flowers when he is able to take you out on a date. I mean, of course he's faithful, right? So using and misusing heuristics. Now we're gonna talk about heuristics for um, 
are thinking and problem solving in ways other than you might think in more logical mathematical ways. There's two kinds of heuristics that have been identified by cognitive psychologists, representative and availability. While heuristics often help us solve problems, they can also bias our judgment. And we're going to talk about how that is. A representativeness heuristic is judging the likelihood of things or objects in terms of how well they seem to represent, hence the name of the heuristic, or match a particular prototype. It allows people to make quick judgments, and we do this all of the time, but let's talk about how it's going to get us in trouble. With representative new heuristic, you have to think about the prototype that you have, and when experiencing new objects or ideas or events or things, you make judgments of, does that fit my prototype? Here's an example. If you were to meet a man dressed in dress slacks and a sweater who is small in stature, wears glasses, is soft-spoken, and somewhat shy, and then were asked if this man were a librarian or a construction worker, what would you say? You would think to yourself, well, based off of what I know, he fits my prototype better for a librarian, although he's male, which probably doesn't meet your prototype of a librarian, um, better than that of a construction worker. Right? So if he's a construction worker, that's going to kind of lead you wrong, lead you to error um, because of judging based on your prototype. And that's a representativeness heuristic. Availability is a cognitive shortcut in which the probability of an event is determined by how easily the event can be brought to mind. It's how available, hence the name, how available the information is in your brain. So you choose the alternative that is most mentally available. Here's an example. People are usually more afraid of dying in a plane crash than in an auto accident, despite the fact that it is exponentially more dangerous to ride in a car. The reason is that plane crashes receive more publicity, much more publicity, um, and therefore we think, oh my gosh, it's so awful and how horrible is a plane crash that we're really afraid of that, even though we're 10 million times, maybe not that much more likely, to be harmed in a car crash. Overconfidence, which we've talked about a little bit way back when, it's a tendency to overestimate the accuracy of one's beliefs and judgments. So think about the last project you had to do. How long do you think it would take you? Did it take longer than that? Overconfidence, while it poses some problems for making decisions, is actually associated with happiness and making tough decisions easier as thinking everything will work out in the end um, can keep us from worrying. So kind of a positive outcome kind of outweighs how you might go wrong with overconfidence. And then exaggerated fear opposed to overconfidence as our tendency for exaggerated fear about how things may happen. Such fears may be ill-founded. So the 9-11 crashes led to decline in air travel due to fear, even though the likelihood of it happening again was very, very minuscule. Framing. Um, and Framing decisions or um, framing as a vocabulary term in general, it's how an issue is presented and it can significantly affect decisions and judgments. And we've talked about priming before, but let's talk about framing more now. Framing the exact same issue in two different ways can produce two very different results. The more positive you make it sound, the more people will respond to it. So an example, what's the best way to market ground beef as 25% fat or 75% lean. It's the same exact thing, but people are more likely to buy something that says 75% lean. Or a surgery, there's a 90% success rate. Whereas if your doctor, doctor said there's like a 10% chance that you're gonna die. Whoa, um, that's like a big percentage for something like death. But it's the same exact thing as it's a 90% success rate, you're gonna be fine. It's just posing the information or presenting it differently. So we have two very similar terms here, belief bias and belief perseverance. Bias is the tendency for one's pre-existing beliefs to distort logical reasoning sometimes by making invalid conclusion. In that you are so stuck on what your belief is, it's biasing your logical reasoning in other areas because you'd rather just stick with what you, what you believe. Belief perseverance is our tendency to cling to our beliefs in the face of contradicting evidence. So if you believe the grass is purple, and this is a silly example, but work with me here. I could show you every piece of scientific evidence, bring in an expert on grass and an expert on color, and prove to you that grass is really green. 
if you stick with belief perseverance though, you still believe that grass is purple. Okay, you just keep going with it. 